Archbishop, very good to see you. Um, Thank you. We're talking about reimagining Britain, the title of your book, at a time where suddenly things feel quite perilous. Mm. What would you say to condemn the attack in Salisbury? I think much of what everybody is saying, that chemical weapons are banned by international law, it's, they are so awful that the whole world has got together and said, you do not use these things. So to use them in any way is completely wrong under all circumstances. And we see here two people um, struck down deliberately, a police officer who would rushed to help them, profoundly injured. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible event and a terrible thing to do. What would your message be to President Putin at this point? It would be that uh, very similar to what others have said, that this is a, a sin and a crime. and. Uh, the people responsible must be held accountable. And would that include right to the very top? I have no idea. Our intelligence people will know that. What do you make of our government's response to it so far? I'm not the Foreign Secretary. I know what I think about it, but uh, uh, I think we, are, we pray for the victims uh, and we pray for all those in leadership in this country and in Russia for wisdom and justice uh, because they're carrying huge burdens. Yeah, you know as well as I do, these questions are so difficult to deal with. There's an unequivocal message to the president of that country. Well, as to where there is any act of terror like this, that, that it is, uh, that the people responsible must be brought to justice. I mean, two people are struggling for their lives. One police officer who's completely innocent um, is, was himself really seriously uh, hurt. Um, those are crimes and as with all crimes the people responsible for perpetration must be brought to justice. And you were in Russia just last November. Indeed. Um, speaking to the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church who was extremely close to the president. Indeed. What? What, if anything, could you do by that connection you now have to get a message from your office with your moral authority to Russia? I don't think... Uh, I mean, we are in touch with the Russian Orthodox Church. They know... They will know our views as well as anyone else is. Um, and... Uh, but getting messages to Russia is a job for the government and not for us to interfere in. This feels like a perilous moment, though, doesn't it? I mean, it, it brings back very many memories of a very difficult time between Russia and the West. What's your sense of it? I think we are more connected, so we know more about these moments. Yes, it's a, it's, it's a more serious moment because... Um, it's the breaking down of a relationship that I think we were hoping to rebuild, particularly after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, um, the changes that happened then. Um, I think it's a time for courage and resilience and hope and trust in God and prayer. And we pray, we pray for all involved. Um, but we don't we mustn't react out of fear and terror, because when you do that, you do the wrong thing. So it's a moment of courage. To go to the title then of the book, Reimagining Britain, I mean, you, you don't pull your punches. You're talking about that your assessment that Brexit has divided the country and austerity has crushed the weak. And this is a message loud and clear from Lambeth Palace to the government over the road. It's, it's a message, it's from... Lambeth Palace, but not just to the government. Austerity has been going on for many, many years. Um, but there's I, a political program we know where it's connected. We do, but we also, if you, in the opening chapter, I think the point I'm making is that, that the moments of decision that we're facing, this 
challenge to reimagine our society is the culmination of many, many years under many different governments of um, things not going ahead and flourishing as they should have done, as they could have done. And we have the opportunity. I think this is more a moment of hope and opportunity. The challenges are enormous. But I'm absolutely certain that with the resources of this country, they can be overcome for the common good. My argument is that if you don't found moments of decisions of change in deep set values, you end up with lousy decisions. Forgive me, that feels a rather broad brush, and we know what we're talking about when you use the word austerity. Yes, we do. This is a path chosen by the government, and you're saying that it has crushed the weak. I'm saying that uh, I, whether it was chosen or whether it was forced on them by circumstances, I'm not going to get into. Go back to 2008 and 9 and the Great Recession. I think austerity, there have been times in the past where we faced austerity. We faced it in the 70s, we faced it in the 40s. But you are pointing very specifically to this point. In I am talking about this point and saying that austerity, when you look at its consequences, has been deeply damaging for the weakest in society. I look at places where I've lived, like Liverpool, which has lost half its annual budget. It's the poorest city, one of the poorest cities in Northwest Europe. At the heart of Christian teaching, and as the Roman Catholic Church established long before we did, is the uh, concept of the common good. So austerity may be necessary in and of itself, but the way it's done must take into account the common good. It must, the load must be borne most heavily by those with the deepest pockets and the greatest strength. And that's a fundamental Christian principle. It's not a political point. It's simply saying that's how justice works in society. But, but forgive me, it is very much a political point. It has you political know, implications. It has political implications yeah. and it has a political resonance. The Prime Minister... Yeah, absolutely. When, when the Prime Minister made her first speech on the steps of Downing Street, she said that she prioritised those who are just about managing. Yes. It felt like a very clear moment in a statement of intent. Yes. Do you see any sign of that happening? I see um, many ways in which they've sought to do this. I think one of the dangers is, and that's, this is why I'm not a politician, is saying, there's a danger in saying, it's this simple, you know, you do X and Y follows. In, in society and in politics, X, Y very seldom follows X. It's so complicated. And the more I see of my own struggles, even with the Church of England, the less inclined I am to criticise any politician because the complexities are so great. But you can't raise the flag over the concern. Oh, yes, I can. <laughs> well, well, then it's a very easy thing for the Archbishop of Canterbury to do then, surely. And then the Archbishop... Point to, to, to where? I'm not going to go for individuals. Whether, whether they're in government or opposition, and say, and unless it's, you know, there, are, there are different circumstances, but uh, I'm not going to go for attack an individual. I see them, I meet them, I respect them for taking on the burdens of office and the responsibility and the struggle. And I respect them for even trying to do that. And I know how difficult the job is, and I respect them for attempting to do it. But what I am saying is, as the Catholic Church has said for over a hundred years, and uh, Anglicans have said since Temple, that in hard times the load must be evenly spread. That's a, a principle which has to be followed. But, but what you're arguing also in the book is, is, is increased support, financial support for housing, education, yes. NHS. You've also called for the scrapping of tuition fees. But you're, you're, with respect, you're not the one who has to balance the books. Scrapping tuition no, fees I quite agree. cost is eleven billion a year. Uh, yes, absolutely, I'm not, and um, uh, that is uh, that's a fair point. Um, but 
the point I'm making on tuition fees is that what we've effectively done is privatised them. Over the long period, scrapping tuition fees is fiscally neutral because you raise in increased taxation what you lose in tuition it fees. It also arguably gives a big benefit to the, the wealthier in our society. It does give a benefit to the wealthier in society, but it also, I think, most importantly says that what you receive in your university education is a gift from the country, not something you've personally purchased. And therefore, you have a duty to the common good. Are you a frustrated politician? Oh, gosh, no. I'm so glad I'm not in politics. Because <laughs> it's rather easy to lay out a programme like this. It's quite easy to lay out a programme like this and not to have to implement it, I agree. But I think also this, it's not a, the aim of the book is about values and there will be many differences about how they work out in practice. But it's trying to say that with the right values, we set foundations which give opportunity and hope for flourishing in our society. And you say in the book, whether Brexit happens or not, we need to rethink our country. Yes. Do you think there's a chance it might not happen? Who knows? Do you think there's a possibility it might not happen in the end? Who knows? I mean, I, would you have said four years ago it's going to happen? I'm not, I'm not into predicting the future. Would you like another vote on it? Uh, I'm not into that either. That's a, that is a purely political point. What I'm into is saying that the issue of values, of the values that guide the way we care for each other and love for each other, springs from our Christian tradition and history and is crucial to how we build a flourishing society. To go to that point about our Christian heritage and history, I mean, where does that moral base come from? and that voice come from regarding the Christian heritage when so many have absolutely turned their back on Christianity. Oh, absolutely. In well, it's a redundant voice in many people's eyes. Yes, but it, um, it's the voice that subconsciously, even for people who have turned their back on it, still triggers certain reactions. They may not be good reactions. Uh, they may not, but it still triggers reactions about what is just and unjust, what is fair and unfair. In other words, it's the default reaction in our ethics comes from more than a thousand years of Christian teaching. It's not consciously Christian, very often, but ideas about should politicians be uncorrupt, uh, that springs from the teaching of the Bible. Should uh, the poor be cared for, that springs from the teaching of the Bible. Um, should, uh, should we seek the common good of society? Should we be courageous? Should we be resilient? Should we care for the environment? These things spring from a deep Christian tradition, often implicit and unconscious. There's a difficulty when institutions like the church, like some of our big charities, mm. fundamentally break trust with the yes, public. Yes, I agree. It neutralises... It deeply and your voice, doesn't it? It deeply damages it. Absolutely. And the way we deal with that is so important uh, because we have to be transparent and honest, not to cover up, not to pretend it's any less bad than it is. And we have to take steps to make sure that it's stopped and changed. And we know that this goes precisely to the point that the Church of England is now in front of the of the independent inquiry, inquiry. Independent inquiry to, to which is an inquiry I called for among others and I'm really glad it's happening but it could be a moment where the church has to reimagine itself let alone oh, totally the church is in the middle of reimagining itself and has been certainly under my predecessor and his predecessor under Rome Williams and George Carey and we'll go on with that we have to reimagine our role our position how we communicate the good news of Jesus Christ, how we live in a way that is convincing. And so when we speak of other things, there is some authenticity. We're never going to be perfect. You know, we're full of human beings, and human beings fail. But mm. we need to have a consistency in how we deal with our own failures and sins. But, but there, is a, there is a bigger issue at heart when an institution like the church, the established church, fails. And the accusation is that the church may have conspired to enable the, the abuse of children. Yes. 
in that situation, it is more than a simple human failing. It is it's a, a deep it human sin. It threatens a cataclysmic loss of trust. It does. It's one of the key institutions in this country. Indeed. I entirely agree. And that's why we have to take it so seriously. That's why we've changed so much of the way we work over the last four or five years uh, that we have, uh, I mean, apart from the resources that have gone in, because you can do all this statistic stuff till you're blue in the face, but we are changing the culture from a culture which was absorbed very much from the culture around us which was deferential to people in authority that wouldn't challenge, that thought clergy was something special, to a culture that says for the church that we have good news and we still you know, run the food banks, we still educate children and do it very, very well, we still care for the homeless, we still do all, we bury, we marry, we baptize, all the different things we do. And we do those superbly but we must never because we do some things well tolerate abuse in any form at all tolerate it hide it fail to confess it not have really tough systems that make it incredibly difficult for people to carry it out it's the loss of faith in institutions like that if people can't even put their faith in an institution like the church or a secular institution like a charity through which people mm. hope to perform their altruism. Reimagining Britain is very diff difficult, isn't it? I agree. It's not only the things we're seeing in the inquiry, and we'll go on seeing, uh, not only betray the church, they betray the country, and worst of all, they betray God. And they deeply damage the survivors who are at the centre of the heart and compassion of God. To move to a different subject, it was reported last week that you baptised Meghan Markle ahead of the really? wedding. What can you tell me about that, Archbishop? Almost nothing at all, <laughs> except it, it, was, it was very special. It was beautiful, um, sincere deeply sincere and uh, very moving. It was a great privilege. And it's also reported you formed quite a bond with her. What do you make of her? I would never talk about a pastoral conversation. <laughs> but an impression as a young woman who's about to be brought into the fold of... As I say, I, I wouldn't talk about pastoral conversations. <clears throat> it's interesting with this particular young woman. She's very vocal. She's used to being able to speak out. She spoke out very powerfully on behalf of women's rights. How might that voice be altered by being brought into the fold of the royal family? And should it be? You I think you'd need to ask your royal correspondent. <laughs> I'm not going to answer it. But I, I, there's a pastoral relationship, and it's just not appropriate to talk about people with whom you have a pastoral relationship. It's not the right way. It's not the right thing to do. But so to, I'm not going to do it. But to lose it. And you can keep going it. round and try different ways. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. But I suppose it's in the principle of somebody who's been allowed to have a voice. A, it's a kind of narrow principle, isn't it? There's only one person to whom it applies. So, as I say, I, I'm just not going there. How are you preparing for the royal wedding? How am I preparing? Well, where uh, we do the... Uh, one has marriage preparation with the couple. You talk about what they want in the wedding. Uh, discuss it with the Dean of Windsor. Um, just what you do for weddings, it's just on a, an infinitely larger scale. Um, and um, I try and remember, unlike um, recent weddings, I must not drop the ring, as I did for one of my staff when I took their wedding. <coughs> and um, I must not forget to get the vows in the right order, as I did at the rehearsal for one of my children's weddings. Fortunately, not in the real thing. But you'll have the, the world's eyes. Yeah, I know. I'm, try, I'm just really trying not to think about that too much. You focus on the couple. It's their day. You know, at the heart of it is two people who have fallen in love with each other, who are committing their lives to each other with the most beautiful words and profound thoughts, who do it in the presence of God, 
through Jesus Christ. You pray for them to have the strength to fulfill their vows. You, um, and you seek to do it in a way that respects their integrity and uh, honors their commitment.